this this came together in a really kind of fun and fortuitous way where uh, when we first got the space for the lab this summer, uh, we had a, a, a good friend at Carpenter, Jason Lane, come in and put together a lot of the woodwork that we see in this lab. And Jason and uh, Vanessa got talking about the Minge Museum, which I, as a new San Diego resident, knew nothing about. And they told me about this amazing exhibit that was going up called Surfcraft. Then a few weeks later, uh, Don Norman, our director, got back from traveling and he walked into Jim and my uh, offices and he said, hey, on my travels, I, I got a gift from my two favorite surfers uh, from MIT Press, uh, this great new book called Surfcraft. And I said, well, that's the catalog for this new Minge exhibit. And so completely out of the blue, uh, I emailed Richard and the folks at the Minge and said, hi, you know, you don't know me from Adam, but we're really excited about what you're doing. Uh, we have a lot of surfers at the school, and is there any chance that, uh, that you might be willing to come and give a talk? And Richard said, absolutely. And uh, they even invited us to the Minge, and so our first lab field trip was to go to the Minge uh, Museum, where we got a, a personal tour from, from Richard of the exhibition. And if you haven't been, it's totally amazing. Uh, if you want to find out about the history of surfing, you can buy the book right back there. And uh, I mean, Richard, Richard's just a wealth of knowledge. I learned so much, and uh, we're really excited to have him here today. Hi, I'm Richard Kenvin. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. I uh, was a, the guest curator for the exhibit at the Minge that, uh, called Surfcraft that Scott was referring to, and um, that exhibit um, puts surfboards in the context of uh, Japanese um, craft and design philosophy by a guy named Yanagi that he developed in the early 20th century. Um, so just really quickly about, about that, um, he uh, was very worried about what mass production was going to do to handcrafts in Japan um, as Japan grew increasingly industrialized after the turn of the century. And so he developed this philosophy that was published in a book called The Unknown Craftsman, which, which I bought at the Minge bookstore about 10 years ago. And as I was doing that, I was working on this, which is this sort of untold history of, of surfboard design, which is, uh, that's a sketch I did um, about 11 years ago, where uh, at the heart of uh, Yanagi's philosophy with Minge is useful unsigned objects and, and the design that goes into them. Functional design, bowls, teacups, could be anything. It could be a surfboard. And as I read his, uh, but he, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on to industrial crafts and artist craftsmanship, which is signed objects, et cetera, et cetera. But the purest form is an unsigned useful object. Like I'm going to skip forward really quickly. Like this board here, for example, which is the oldest board in the exhibit. Um, it's at least 120 years old. And it was, it was, it's from Oahu. And uh, it's a paha board, which is a sort of a pipo belly board, which would be a predecessor to um, a knee board or a boogie board today. And this board was hewn from a single trunk of a breadfruit tree. And uh, later, after it was used as a board to ride waves, it was used to pound poi as a table, as a poi pounding table. So that's like pure highest level of Minge. And uh, so all of going back to this one, all of these boards that I was researching that kind of kind of fell out of the status quo history of surfing, almost all of them, um, the guys that made them didn't sign them or anything. So as I, I read, and they're very, very functional, as I read um, Yanagi's words on Minge, I, I, it all applied to the surfboards that I was researching. And it also applied to, you know, because he was, 
he was saying hand craftsmanship must survive, but hand, hand craftsmanship must also work in tandem with mass production in order to have well-produced things for the masses, because he knew that you couldn't maintain just a feudal system of anonymous craftspeople making every single item by hand, especially with today's population. But, so anyway, all of, all of that stuff really uh, spoke to me as far as uh, it helped me to um, look at surfboards and surfboard design and the people that make them and, and like your guys' TOM, um, think, observe, make, that's very much it, and then use or originate or something. So um, that's how that came about. Um, so what I'm doing in this, in this here, I'm, I'm trying to trace back all these different lineages that go really, this one's very small, but this is a ancient Hawaiian alaya board, and this one down here would be a pipo board, and then these over here are boards made by uh, Bob Simmons, who was a guy that uh, really um, created the uh, hydrodynamic architecture for a, for a surfboard in the 40s, and he died at Wind and Sea Beach in 1954, and it his, his, his stuff went into surfboard design, but, it, but the, main, um, the main key components of his hydrodynamic theory didn't, um, which is, we'll get into that later. Well, that's the Paha board. So this is, these are the, uh, the collection, part, part of the collection of um, traditional Hawaiian surf craft that are, that are housed in the Bishop Museum on Oahu. And this is sort of, um, that's the, the minge, those, those boards there are the, the center of the uh, design and craft universe of, of surfing. And um, I've been able to go over and, and, and see some of those boards. And uh, the longer I worked on this project, the more I began to understand how um, sophisticated hydrodynamically um, the traditional Hawaiian surfboards were and that their surfing culture was. And uh, in recent years, we've been able to advance surfboard design um, by looking towards what, what they were doing and what Bob Simmons was doing. And there's a relationship between the two. And, um, so today, we've been able to go back and look at a lot of the design components of boards like that and sort of redesign the surfboard to the point where um, they're, um, the boards that I ride these days, working with younger guys that have been following this stuff, are the best surfboards I've ever ridden. And I've been surfing for a long time. So this is a... a I just grabbed this off the Bishop Museum website this morning, but um, this is Princess Kaiulani's Alaya board, and she was, um, she sort of had, well, it's, it's a sort of a tragic, it's a very tragic story. Um, the monarchy of Hawaii was kind of taken in a coup in the late 1800s, and uh, she suffered tremendously because of that. But this is her board here, which is very similar to this board, which is a remake, similar to this. Which is a, I was able to see this board, um, the original, in 2006 in the Bishop Museum. And, and when I saw it, um, people hadn't really begun writing these again. It was just starting, and uh, I looked at it, and I went, there's things going on in that board that are just incredible, but I had no idea how you would design, or why you would design a board like this with no flotation, very hard to paddle, extremely thin, doesn't operate off buoyancy at all, whereas in the, in the 20th century, everything about surfboards, or when the, in the 40s, they'd say, what should, what's a good board? What should I, they'd just get one that floats. You know, that was as far as they were going with design series. But anyway, there's a lot of very sophisticated stuff going on when one of these rise a wave. And you guys would probably have a better grip on exactly what's going on with that physically than I do. But um, 
so that's her her board, which I consider a very um, important piece of design. Um, let's see, that's a picture of it. You can see how close this one is to it. That's the princess's board that's housed over there. I don't think any of these boards ever leave the bishop. I, I can't imagine they ever would. And this is an 18th or 19th century, early 19th century, I think, engraving done by, I think, a French artist visiting Hawaii. And you can see these uh, European engravings of surfing were pretty fanciful, but also I think there's a, a lot of, of truth and reflection in, in, in what they were writing. And you can see similar short little finless straight rail boards that they're writing. And that's a photo of the princess. This is a um, painting that she did when she was sort of in exile in New York City, I believe. Um, it's a really beautiful work of art, I think. And it, it's diamond head in the background, but then she has these non-native flowers and species sort of coming in. But I just put that in there just to... So anyway, this is... Um, the genesis of really modern, progressive surfboard design comes, I think, from, from Bob Simmons in the 40s and 50s. And then these guys here, which were, were Hawaiian surfers. Um, the top guy is Wally Froiseth. Next down is George Downing. And then it's John Kelly at the bottom. And these guys would go into the bishop and look at the old boards and were inspired and they made a finless board called the hot curl. Those are those big pointy boards behind them. And then they made a replica of the princess's board as well. And um, these guys met Simmons in the 40s and that's sort of the genesis of, of um, modern surfboard design on all fronts. Um, the, the thing is, is that as, surf, as surfing took off in the late 50s and 60s, what happened was the single fin design became, had a lock on, on everything. And yet Wally at the top there and Bob Simmons had both invented and used very successfully dual fin designs that were very short and everything. That's, that's the cornerstone of good design, multiple fins on, uh, as far as what drives surfing today but it just did not catch on because of the grip that the single fin had on everyone's mentality. And that's a very interesting sort of social science uh, um, situation. This is a Wally's notebook. Uh, we interviewed him in 2006, and you can see this is a little pipo board that he had. He has this notebook with all these little boards that he made in the 50s, and they were, they were about this big, and they're they're basically updated versions of the, f the first Ulu breadfruit board I showed you, and he would ride them in Hawaii. This one, he, he put a speedometer in it, he, and he actually said he clocked himself going 25 miles an hour, which is very fast for a surfboard. And uh, there's a picture of Wally riding one. And this is, in the, uh, this is probably in the late 1950s. So what surfboard, so he's riding this tiny little board with no flotation. He used swim fins to ride it. So this is really the genesis of shortboard surfing, modern surfing, skateboarding, all that stuff comes from uh, that type of thing. But it was very obscure and a novelty. Everybody was riding huge boards with, with single fins. Um, so now we're going to move into Bob Simmons. This, this was designed by, by Simmons's brother, um, Edward Dewey Simmons, and that's the, the part of the patent information for the electronic strain gauge, which some of you guys might be familiar with because it's still in wide use today. Simmons's older brother invented that, and he invented it um, while he was uh, doing his ad ad masters or something at Caltech. Caltech tried to steal it from him, and he fought them in court and succeeded in being awarded the patent by 1949. But that instrument that, that Simmons's brother invented was uh, hugely influential, and it was influential in surfboard design, too. 
This is a picture of Dewey Simmons, Edward Simmons. Um, he was an extremely eccentric character, as was Bob Simmons. He decided that uh, Renaissance dress was the appropriate dress for Southern California, <laughs> no doubt about it. And uh, he um, dressed that way for probably 40 years until he passed away in 1994. And he would wander the Caltech campus where the students gave him all kinds of funny nicknames like Leotardo and other things like that. And uh, D Dr. Strain Strange Gage was another one. Um, but that's, he fought the city of Pasadena for the family home because they were ripping him off with property taxes. So he stood them down and lived in front of the car. And that's a whole article about the whole thing. But there's a new movie out um, with Benedict Cumberbatch about um, Turin, uh, the code breaker. Um, and I think that both of the Simmons brothers are very much in character with, with uh, I haven't seen the film yet, but they're very much in the same vein as that. Extremely influential people that um, maybe didn't get the recognition that they deserved because of their eccentricity. Um, this is the Naval Architecture of Planning Holes, which is a book that, a study that was published on planning hole design for powered boat hulls by Lindsay Lord, who was a naval architect and taught naval architecture at MIT. And uh, this was published in 1946. The tests here were conducted in, in Pearl Harbor in 1945 because uh, towards the end of World War II, the Navy, um, prior to his career with the Navy, Lord was designing uh, rum running boats for the mafia during prohibition. And the government knew that he knew more about powered planning hull type craft than anybody because they could never catch his boats. And that's how so much liquor got up from rum, came up from Miami and all that stuff. Um, but anyway, you can see he conducted this at Pearl Harbor. He was uh, in the preface to the book. There's Hawaiian names, local names. There's a boat shop, the Pearl Harbor Boat Shop. It's all on the south shore of Oahu, which is all sort of ground zero for those type of pipo craft. So what those really are, and, they're, and, they're, and the re, the, how he's quantifying the data is he's using a, a, strain, a Simmons strain gauge. So there's a relationship here. Bob Simmons got this book, that's the younger brother, and started designing surfboards according to that study. This is a recent, fairly recent photo of Ryan Birch, who's a young surfer from Encinitas, incredible talent. And we made some boards that are basically just this shape. And Ryan did some of the most incredible surfing that anyone's ever seen riding these super basic planing shapes. So that rectangular shape, I gave my iPhone to Michelle, but it's also the same shape, you know, as your phone and all such stuff. But it's just, an, you could, well, I just thought of selling that one to Apple, but I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that particular shape, um, so the history of was like dictated by the single fin, which is this sort of, they're great, they're classic. I wrote them all the time when I was a kid and everything, and we love them. And, uh, but uh, as far as the dynamic, hydrodynamic function, um, everyone should know about that, because that's the ground zero of it, this simple ancient shape that's pretty much the same aspect ratios of that old, old board that I showed you at the very beginning. This is a pipo writer named Raymond Hukano with his pipo uh, that he designed. Um, and he arrived at that sort of same, uh, sort of more of a, slightly more of a trapezoid because he liked to dig the edges in. But it's, again, it's this, this basic rectangular shape that is the uh, very, very simple. But there's things going on with it hydrodynamically that are very powerful and complex, I think. This is another uh, local in Barbados. This was taken in the 80s. And a, sail, uh, a yacht wrecked on the coast there. And these guys went in and took like the cupboard doors and, and things that are made out of mahogany and teak and started riding them and just ripping on them. This is one of my favorite surfing images of all time. 
This is just uh, W2 from Bob Simmons, uh, where Caltech is paying him for something. Uh, I'm not sure what. He would have been pretty young at this point, and this is in 1945, so I'm just going to try to get into Simmons quickly here. This is a picture of Simmons um, on the north shore of Oahu. He went there for nine months in 1953, and that's in a little Quonset hut somewhere. You can see he's got his nameplate up there, R.W. Simmons, and he's reading the paper. This is a photo of Simmons um, not too long before, before he died. That's at the foot of Marine Street in La Jolla. You might be able to recognize that now if you went back there. And then the, the beach would be right there. But he's uh, talking to some other surfers, probably talking about design. This is Simmons' car, again at the foot of Marine Street. He had customized this car and lived in it uh, at times and traveled all over the California coast. And you can see the, um, the, just the beautiful outline of his board. And that's a dual keel hydrodynamic planing hull with handles on it because he had to use those to get through big surf. And he, he was a big wave rider. He loved riding big waves. And this was on a huge day in La Jolla. I know the stories behind it. And if you go back in the NOAA's records, a lot of these years in the early 50s and late 40s, several of them were big El Nino years. So they had a lot of really big surf at that time. So this is an example of a Simmons hydrodynamic planing hull. This board's in the exhibit. Um, it's just an extremely so he made this board in 19, around 1948. It's very short. The riding portion of it is extremely short. Um, it really, the wetted planing area would, would just be this area in here, and, and that, that's about this big. So this is all stuff that was credited much later to other people, but, but he originated it and sort of had this fulfilled um, design long ago. This is a boomerang that he made. He was an expert boomerang thrower, and he, he used what was going on aerodynamically. He was a mathematician. He went to Caltech on a scholarship like his brother Dewey. Um, once he started surfing, he had one semester left to um, graduate, and then he just kind of went surfing. And he was going to San Diego State. He'd re-enrolled because his family talked him into just finish, get, get the degree, and then you can teach, and then you'll be able to surf a lot more. And so he was actually doing that at the time of his death, just, just to possibly go into teaching. Um, so he used what was going on aerodynamically with lift on the, on the, the leading air edge foils of the boomerangs, because he, he was basically knew that it, in his mind, it was doing the same thing as the rail of a surfboard going through the water and lifting. This is uh, from an old book that a friend of mine has that I've only seen once, but that's a little, this was from 1963, which is this text up here is actually very, um, acknowledges Simmons in a really um, appropriate way and then as the years went by that sort of got lost a lot of other people that didn't pass away when they were really young sort of seemed to have taken uh, tried to take a lot of the credit and control the design stuff of surfboards to the detriment of surfboard design but that's a very old picture of Simmons it's July 31st 1949 and he's at Malibu and he's riding a dual-finned hydrodynamic planing hull with a, with a, a, a foam core sandwiched between plywood with balsa rails and then glassed, which was he also pioneered, um, one of the main pioneers of using a resin fiberglass and those sort of things. And uh, he was hit by a bicycle or he was hit by a car riding a bike, I think when he was 17 or, or not, when he was a teenager, and it, and it almost destroyed his left arm. It almost killed him. Um, so he had limited use of his, of his, of his left arm. Um, but his boards were so efficient that he could, he could catch waves and surf uh, with the best of them. 
This is from that book as well, and this is an interesting photo to me because he had a rivalry going with, with Joe Quigg in a way. They were friends, but they were also rivals, and Quigg was the main proponent of the single fin and, told, and, and said Simmons's boards didn't work. And this one I'd always heard about this. So here they're having a sliding contest or something, but you can see this is Simmons on the bottom and that's Quigg on the top. And, Simmons is going to pass him on the bottom of the wave, and most surfers know that it's the high line is where the speed is. So Simmons taking the slow route, and he's still going to pass Quig up, and um, that's a great. But yet, but yet their wakes merge into one wake, which is sort of what happened now because both the two different design schools came together, eventually through trial and error. So I kind of think that's poetic. There's a photo of um, John Elwell who took those old photos of Simmons in La Jolla. Um, and that's taken down at the Tijuana Slough, which is where the, those guys rode a lot in the um, late 40s and early 50s. And it's a big wave spot. There'll be some big waves there on Thursday or Friday. Um, it's ex the, the situation where there were 50,000 people living in Tijuana at that time. And this was a beautiful dunescape with hermits and driftwood shacks and stuff living there. Um, it's awesome that a local surfer that I know named Serge Dedina just got elected mayor of uh, Imperial Beach, who's a good, so that's great. But uh, anyway, that's John Simmons' board. And I, my, a lot of the information that I learned about Simmons was through this guy here, John Elwell. This is a picture of me riding a replica of that board uh, at La Jolla Cove a couple years ago. So we started replicating these Simmons boards out of balsa wood um, exactly like the originals. The originals are considered too valuable to ride, so we made uh, some perfect replicas of them and would go and surf them and learn a lot about, about design through doing that. And uh, this photo is, shows that what Elwell, what John would tell me all this stuff, um, and he was right about everything he said, because the, the common knowledge was I would go to the, these museums that have the boards, and they would tell me that Simmons boards don't work because the tails were too wide, and you can't ride a twin fin in big waves, and this, that, or the other thing. And then uh, we would go out and do it, and everything that John said, which was, was what those guys are saying is nonsense. They, the, the bullshit's been flying thick for 50 years. That's what he told me straight from his mouth as far as design. And so he would say this is the transband flow coming off the wing as it's engaged in dynamic lift. And I believe him. Like, cause that's <laughs> the board will go on a trajectory and accelerate like crazy. Um, this is getting into. Uh, out of Simmons and into how Simmons sort of um, largely through some people here in San Diego kind of stayed in design in, in, through some very obscure uh, boards that were made. And this photo was taken in 1960. This is in a backyard on um, Diamond Street in PB. And so this board here would be the state-of-the-art hot dog surfboard of 1960. It's uh, foam and fiberglass. It has a huge single D fin that's probably that big. And then this board, it was a board made by um, Al Nelson, uh, who was a, a wind and sea um, surfer and a genius in his own right. And uh, he had some leftover balsa, and he made this very short 5'6" dual fin surfboard that he and Butch Van Artsdalen and a lot of other guys rode at Wind and Sea in the late 50s, just this one board. And this board is, you know, pure Simmons principles with dynamic keels coming out. They're even canted a little bit, toed. Um, so this photo just reappeared. I'd heard about this board forever. It's in my sketch that was at the top and everything. And through Carl Ekstrom, who's here in the audience, um, was able to uh, get this photo of this board recently, so that was a big deal to me just to have the, be able to see it. There's a close-up of it. So there were these two young boys down at Winnancy in the 50s, the Morandon brothers, um, Nick and Barry Morandon, 
And they saw these guys riding this board. And then 10 years later, in 1967, this big shortboard revolution was happening through George Greeno but, and uh, these Australian guys. But again, it was single fins with big V bottoms. And the boards got shorter, but they didn't get more functional. These guys remembered Al's little board because they were their minds were kind of blown when they were kids watching these guys surf this board. And um, part of the reason this didn't really go anywhere was that Al and Butch and all of those guys, Pat Kern, that whole generation of Win and See went to Hawaii and pioneered, as far as West Coast Howleys, pioneered um, big big wave surfing over there. Butch was the first guy to really um, surf pipeline on Oahu in a, in, a, in a way that's comparable to what guys are doing now. So those guys went over to Hawaii and they were just riding big waves on, they came under George Downing's influence, the guy at the beginning, and they rode big gunny boards. But So anyway, the Mirandans developed this dual fin board called the twin pin. And it's kind of a flash in the pan novelty, but it's a bridge board. And they came up with this um, because they were inspired by what they'd seen on this board here. And that's a group of old twin pins thrown in with some Simmons boards and a list fish, et cetera. And there they are at work. That's in Sereno Valley a few years ago. So anyway, at the same time, this guy, Steve Liss, was 15 years old and a kneeboarder, and he knew the Mirandans. He wasn't new. They had a sort of a parallel, like, um, they both were enlightened on this dual fin thing at basically the same time. So dual fins and split tails. He was from Point Loma, incredibly talented surfer, and he designed this board called the Fish. And, and that's what he's, what he's got right there. So it's a dual keel, small split tail board. All of a sudden, it's all of Simmons' principles that were, there, that were in the Simmons dual fins, only it's on, in a short little vehicle. And instead of it being 1947, now it's 1967, 68. And uh, this is a picture of Steve riding one at uh, Big Rock in La Jolla. And uh, that would be in the 70s here. So Steve Liss made this little board that did incredible things. It was a quantum design leap forward, but it was just for kneeboarders so much uh, uh, initially. This is another photo of a fish at Big Rock. That's Mark Skinner. That's a, you know extremely shallow, critical. And this is in the early 70s um, when everybody else was riding single fins. And uh, what these kneeboarders were doing at Big Rock in La Jolla was some of the most progressive surfing ever done for its time. And this is Jeff Ching, who was the first guy to stand up on a fish. And he moved here to attend school, um, befriended Steve Liss, saw Steve Liss riding his little tiny kneeboard. And, and just to give it some perspective, the other boards that were being ridden at this time were long single fins and then these V bottoms that were coming up from Australia, all single fins as well. And th this was just light years beyond um, what was out there in the status quo. So Jeff grew up on the South Shore, he's Hawaiian. He grew up on the South Shore of Oahu and he watched the Pipo riders riding their rectangular planing Pipo boards with no buoyancy. And when Jeff saw Steve Liss's knee board, he knew that's a, that's a Pipo board that floats with fins in it. And like, I can ride that. And he paddled out on this little board this big. And, and to me, that's um, one of the biggest uh, moments in uh, 20th century surfing as far as stand-up surfing when Jeff Ching took Steve Liss's little board and started stand-up surfing on it. This is a collection of sort of Liss spin-offs. Lots of um, these, most of these boards are, were made by a friend of mine named Hans Newman. He made them when he was a teenager and he was a big rock surfer and he hung out with Liss. And so you had all these other guys building boards in their garages based off Steve Liss's design. And you had this whole little group of, of boards. And a lot of these boards are in the exhibit. 
Um, so Hans has got all kinds of creative things going on there. This board in the front, I call the missing link. It's it's probably a hundred and years old. It was it, it's this it's this obscure old uh, surf bathing board, with all sorts of dynamic features to it. Um, this is the friendly welcome mat at Big Rock in the early 70s. That's Rex Huffman on the right. I was talking to him today and he looked out at the crowd. Big Rock was very good today. It was extremely crowded, unbelievably crowded. So Rex didn't even go out. He's in his 60s, but he's still, uh, so obviously not that none of the guys out there were what we would call goons. They were all very good surfers, but nobody kept out. They're all there. This is a more recent photo of Steve Liss. He lives on Hawaii, I mean on Kauai. And that's a, a quad board that he made. I'm just going really far forward here. So coming here, these are the boards that really in the mainstream got more of the attention as far as how we got to a, a modern tri-fin surfboard. This is an IPA Sting. Again, it's a single fin. This board came into being in around 1974, 1975, which is almost 10 years later than, than the Mirandon brothers and Steve Liss were making their um, split tail dual fin boards, which are actually uh, pretty, pretty dynamically functional. But Ben Ipa did this, and uh, guys like Larry Bertelman in Hawaii, uh, this board, this, this thing really uh, progressed surfing in its own right. But then what happened was Mark Richards, an Australian pro, was working with Ben Ipa and decided to, to sort of get a, a dual fin, twin fin board that's like, so again, he's coming back to Simmons and, and Mark, without knowing it, Mark, he knew nothing about Simmons at all. So they arrived at this sort of thing through trial and error. But everybody, like all, everyone knows about this board, but very few people would know about the Mirandon's twin pin, which predates it by a decade. And, um, or the list fish would tend to not be the board that is given the, the, the design credit this board would be. Um, but Mark Richards was also very inspired by seeing fish riders because they had the uh, world championship here in San Diego in 1972 and it was won by a guy riding a fish board. This is a skateboard made to look like a Mirandon's twin pin. So this would be a roller derby uh, skateboard with clay wheels. And I love this photo and this board because it, it shows this time when the surfboard was the design that, the, that there was a time where you wanted your skateboard to, to work like your surfboard. And this was from that time before the urethane wheel came out, which revolutionized everything. So these guys actually made this board to look like a Mirandon's twin pin or a fish, and they cut a little swallowtail in it and everything. But then what happened was this guy, Frank Nosworthy, who was a fish rider and a surfer, uh, went in a, a roller derby rink on the East Coast in 1970 or 71 and saw these urethane wheels. And he's an engineer. He lives in Carlsbad. And he innovated this urethane skateboard wheel. And his, part of his inspiration was wanting to have a skateboard that rode like his fish surfboard. So that's, there's a very distinct bridge between those surfboard designs, including the IPA sting, the fish, and everything, into what became skateboarding, which is this huge form of dry land surfing that's and one of the greatest physical art forms out there. Um, so Frank distributed those wheels first in San Diego, and I and my friends, when I was 13 or 14, were among the first to be able to ride on the urethane wheel. Coming from riding clay and metal wheel skateboards at that time, it's difficult to express how the simple design innovation of getting urethane underneath there, something that gripped, I mean, it was crazy what that did. Um, there's a photo of Tony Alva a few years after Frank's innovation. What happened with Frank was he led, and then the people that had more sophisticated business plans and access to precision bearings and other things like that made all the money. And Frank kind of was the guy that brought it in. And that happens continually, I think, in, in design. 
So this is Alva doing one of the very first airs out of a pool and landing it, which is another huge thing. And everything he's doing was based on visions that we had from surfing. Um, this was all stuff that surfers in the 70s and the 60s, there's cartoons of, by Rick Griffin, et cetera, where people are leaving the wave, et cetera, et cetera. But then what happened was when Frank made the wheel and then skateboard deck technology took off, then all those, those dreams became manifested on concrete instead of on waves, um, which they are now. But uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So this is Tony a few years ago riding a Simmons-inspired uh, short planing hull, which he loves, you know. And so Jay Adams just passed away, but Tony Alva is still He's like 57 or 58 years old and still skating pools like crazy and surfing all the time. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, so he's like this living, and he's not, you know, when he's talking about surfing and skateboarding, he's talking about it from a way where he's as the originator, originator and the practitioner. And so I always listen to him whenever he does. But he loves short, skatey surfboards, fishes, Simmons boards, all that sort of thing. This is a board made by Daniel Thompson, so I'm kind of getting to the end of the evolution here. Um, that Daniel designed that board on the end there, where Daniel uh, is a surfer from Australia. Um, we rode Simmons replicas, Steve List fish boards, et cetera, et cetera, for a long time. And then Daniel started applying his own uh, his own theories, et cetera, based a lot on what Simmons was doing and has made these really high performance boards. And that's one of his prototypes, carbon fiber, all built by hand. Uh, he shaped it, glassed it, everything. I think it's been getting ready for a scan there for a, that's with the Bondo and stuff on it. And this is a picture of Daniel riding that board down at Wind and Sea. That board is very, very small, but it's extremely efficient um, so he's gone through, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of handmade prototypes to arrive where he's continually evolving it. But he uses Simmons as a basic uh, hydrodynamic architecture for his boards. And this is a photo of me with this board in front of the um, Japan Folkcraft Museum in Japan in 2009, which is where Minge, this was the museum that Yanagi founded in Tokyo. And uh, I was able to ride that board over there in Japan. That's a picture of me riding that particular board. This is a picture of this board here. Um, or you can see I brought, this was the, before I started doing all my digging into all this stuff, this was the last sort of what I would call more conventional custom board that I got from Rusty Priesendorfer, who I rode Rusty's boards since I was 10 years old. Um, but you can see what, which I would consider this, this board here pretty much a product of trial and error without deep knowledge of Simmons, without deep knowledge of the Elia and parallel rails. And then this, is a board that I ride quite a bit today. A couple of things about the construction of this board. The, the blank is from Clark Foam, who's not around anymore. Clark Foam did a lot of things for uh, polyurethane foam, et cetera, et cetera, and progressed the industry of surfing by making foam available. Um, but on the other hand, he didn't do much to innovate anything else and, and had kind of a a monopoly on things. Um, he walked away from the business in 2005, which everyone thought was a total disaster, and like, how, how is the surf indus board industry gonna exist? But it ended up being one of the best things that ever happened, because lots of new technologies came in. Um, so most of the things about this board, uh, it's, it's a polyester resin, it's a very petroleum, very, very not ecologically friendly. Um, I'm not like putting this board down. I'm just talking about trying to give an example of 
um, through our observing like your thing and paying attention to these very old boards and some stuff that might have been lost, how we arrived at this, which is a extremely efficient, one of the best boards I've ever ridden. Um, it's directly, it's, it has a direct design relationship to the ancient Hawaiian boards and to the, the boards of Bob Simmons. Um, it's very much scaled down within a certain ratio, which happens to be the Fibonacci uh, 1.6, which worked really well. Um, it's, uh, this is a prototype. It's um, done in conjunction with a, a nonprofit called Sustainable Surf, where they're trying to find, um, promote ways to make more sustainable surfboards. Um, this board has a polonia wood skin, completely renewable. It has a recycled foam blank. Um, anyway, so this is sort of the other end of the spectrum. And uh, this board came about through, as I said earlier, through um, learning all that stuff about Simmons and, and the ancient ancient Hawaiian board. So that's just an example of how through looking at all that stuff, we actually, we wanted a better surfboard and we wanted a board that rode like a skateboard. That was our whole thing. We very much, and so now we're closer to that than we've ever been. These boards really feel like you're riding a skateboard. That's a picture of me riding that board down at Wind and Sea. That's another version of that board. That's down at Scripps Pier last winter. Here's another that's down at Black Speech. And then I ended this. I, I, I'm terrible with planning and organization, and uh, Carl Ekstrom is, is here. I threw this slideshow together today uh, after trying to surf um, in the morning. <laughs> so this is a board made by Carl, and Carl is here with us tonight. Uh, he developed asymmetry as a design solution in 1965, and um, all the boards I've focused on in this presentation have been symmetrical, but the asymmetric surfboard is a very functional design as well, um, and Carl has been the innovator of it, and uh, he's passed that on to Ryan Birch, who was the the guy I showed the picture of the square board, and Ryan has, like Daniel Thompson, Daniel Thompson is very into perfect symmetry. I mean, he's into sacred geometry, perfect symmetry. Carl and Ryan Birch are into asymmetry, and the two things function very, very well. They're different, but then again, it's just a, des it's a design feature, and I think um, part of it is uh, just having being open-minded and being able being being willing to observe and then make and then try and do get empirical research on these designs and try things that that work and that's been uh, what we've been doing and so that's the last photo um, I do have a little video edit but I think I talked for quite a while so we could skip that or I could show it <laughs> Let's take a few questions and then if we still have time we'll watch Okay, that. sure. Hmm? So uh you think about the uh the return of uh fishes and quads and mm -hmm. all the Well, um, I think the Simmons stuff appears without any real conscious knowledge of Simmons. And I think a lot of people, um, those boards, end up having elements of Simmons design that, that he originated, but maybe the person that made them wasn't directly inspired by Simmons, I would imagine. They'd be more inspired by um, Liss, et cetera. And then Steve Liss, wasn't inspired by Simmons. He just intuitively came on that design. But the boards that we've been working on are directly inspired by 
by Simmons. Does that answer your question? Or, or, um, I'm kind of wondering uh, uh, about the, the effect of, of like fin placement mm -hmm. and how that evolved. Like, uh, that was one thing that just changed over time. You know, you said it started with just like a single fin uh, in the middle, and then, and then there were some with two fins, and then this one here that you say is uh, super yeah. vision has five. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what that actually does to, uh, to the ride functionally. Well, the fin is the directional stabilizer, so you can have a lot of um, variation in it, and you can also use no fin at all. But the point I was trying to make with Simmons was that he designed a rail that lifts, and he had a, a specific planing surface between them, and then he, he, the fin to him was not that important. He called it a directional stabilizer and just to make it go straight, and, the, and he placed it out on the rail, so it's, it's working really efficiently with the rail as the rail lifts. So this is a good example, M Mark Richards' board. Uh, this was in the, um, 1978 was when he really came out with it uh, in the arena of early professional surfing in competition. And uh, at that time, everybody was still riding single fins. Uh, Rabbit Bartholomew won the 1978 World Championship on a single fin. When Mark Richards got the fins out on the rail, so it gets that dynamic lift again, like Simmons, nobody ever won a world title on a single fin ever again. That's just the power of what, what that can do performance-wise for a surfboard. Um, so it's just hydrodynamically, it's a much more efficient way to do the kind of surfing that people wanted to do. I mean, because you can do all, single fin surfing is very beautiful and, and, and all that sort of thing, but as far as where people wanted to go with it, you know, where people wanted to go with surfing, what they wanted to do, it was getting the fin out on the rail to work with the rail is what really made people's dreams come true, kind of. Because the other thing was when Simon Anderson made the thruster, which I somehow I lost that photo, um, that was a moment where he combined the two, the single fin and the dual fin. The single fin was now at the back and in equal size, so it functioned really well, but sort of as a steering mechanism, not as like the engine or it's got to be a single fin or this, that, or the other. It was like the engine was the two fins in front, and this was like the steering and brakes was this little fin in the back. And when he did that, that was a similar thing to the, to the urethane skateboard wheel. That was like a, one of those things that just pushed things forward so fast. And like when I first rode one, it was like, this is the board I've been waiting for forever and ever. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, again, I heard the woman that wrote the script, I believe, or the book for the new film that I was talking about, Turin, I believe, Alan Turin is, is the guy, and I think it's a really interesting um, thing about human beings, in a way, that plays into design, but then it also plays into just whatever the power structure is, right? I mean, because... Um, we, you, you, it's everywhere. I mean, you look at where we live in Southern California, it's not really designed for people. It's designed for automobiles. And uh, what's behind all that? It, you know, it's, they're, they're trying to get a trolley to come up to UCSD, and I mean, I, the, the amount of bureaucratic red tape and everything just to get that trolley up here to come back and forth. Um, so with Simmons and his brother, I think with Simmons in particular, he was just so eccentric and different that he just didn't, um, you know, people like that become sort of lightning rods sometimes for things that are negative. And then I, I know from my own experience, when I started surfing when I was nine years old, I followed what was in the media and things were thrown at me that were really progressive, including fish boards and other things, but I became very in influenced by 
media and, and that sort of thing, what everybody else was doing, and it just sort of perpetuates. And I think these things, surfing is, is a really crazy mirror to um, chronologically and otherwise to sort of the Industrial Revolution, imperialism, what happened with, with design. I mean, it was navigational instruments like the sextant and things like that, and chronometers uh, that really um, got precision instruments down and, and things, things like that. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about that stuff. I read people like Lewis Mumford and other people where it kind of shows the big picture of the whole power structure and how it affects us in society. But I guess what we have now is the internet and you have to try to keep that democratic because that's the one thing that can help change things. I mean, does that answer your question? But I mean, <laughs> I'll ramble on that stuff a lot. But uh, surfers are very, um, the skateboard, skateboarding evolved really fast after Frank made the wheel, and I think a lot of that was because um, skaters weren't as locked into surfing as this very regimented status quo kind of thing. I don't know how to explain it, but it's always sort of been that way. It's weird because it's one of the most creative things you can do, and there's so many ways to do it, and there's been so many brilliant people like like Simmons and Carl and all kinds of other people that are extremely creative and open-minded and yet in the mainstream it's, it, it has this very um, slow and closed, doesn't want to change kind of thing. You, it's, it's hard to explain but with skateboards they let it go. They evolve, like okay we, we want to skate vertically, we want to go in the air, what can we do to the deck, what can we do to the trucks. They didn't, because the first boards like I showed like that one, I mean they made them look like <laughs> surfboards and then when they first came out with the wheels the skateboards looked like single fin pin tail surfboards and now they sell those things again these little <laughs> things but you know people like Tony Alva and Christian Asoy and all those guys they they just wanted boards where they could that would let them do what they wanted to do in their mind and they didn't let the fact that you know the deck's going to be concave or whatever like stop them or it's supposed to look like this they just let all that go and it just progressed like crazy. Mm -hmm. I have a question kind of surrounding your theoretical framework and this idea, because mm -hmm. I come from the social sciences, so mm -hmm. I'm looking mm -hmm. at this whole revolution and historical mm -hmm. trajectory from the different mm -hmm. lens. And I'm wondering, you know, one of the aftermaths of the Clark phone closure was mm -hmm. kind of this export of producing blanks in China. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering just your personal opinion if this kind of how you said this repeated cleaningness to the history and back to the original and the unknown craftsman mm -hmm. is more of like the industry's response to their own fear that quality overseas isn't mm. as good as quality here in the States because I think a lot of the discourse in documentaries I've seen, surfing articles I've read, people mm -hmm. I've talked to is like mm -hmm. quality is com compromised for the surfing industry when our products mm -hmm. in the foam that we want to retain for, you know, I have mm -hmm. a fire wire, but mm -hmm. I still know like lost, you know, these other types of phones and polyhydrate mm -hmm. are still used. Um, I'm just wondering like if you, what your opinion is on that, what your perspective is, because there's a lot of impetus for the industry to still generate revenues, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I suppose so. Um, what I've seen is number one, just switching over to epoxy resins is, um, it helps a board become a lot greener right away. And um, as far as on the on the bigger picture, um, I know that Firewire. I was probably number one Firewire hater uh, out there until a couple of years ago. And what what they did was they came to Daniel and looked at his extremely progressive designs that nobody had ever seen before and people didn't get and they fully completely backed him and believed in him. Um, that's Daniel Thompson. So they rose many, many notches in my book there um, when they did that. And um, they're manufactured in Thailand. They bent over backwards to try to get a, a factory going here in Carlsbad and they just couldn't make it work financially, you know. 
So um, I'm not as um, probably up on what's, what I do know is that on the level of pro surfing, there's this old model, the Clark Foam model, and it is still dominating. Like, don't get me wrong, it's totally dominating. It's polyurethane blanks, or sanded finished acrylic. The pros, the amount of boards that the pros go through is obscene. I mean, obscene. Each pro that's in the Pipe Masters in Hawaii right now probably went over there. They probably each have 30 or 35 boards each. And these boards are designed for like one-time use practically. They'll break, they're, you know, so on that highest level, I don't think there's much going on. I think the best thing going on as far as I can see is what these guys, are Sustainable Surf, and I think Firewire as far as a technology company is pretty, pretty out there and they're very environmentally um, conscious and trying to make a better board with different materials and, and, a, and a different construction model. They're also trying, they have a business model and they're trying to make money as well. You know, but traditionally, and Carl would say this, like surfboards has not been a way for people to get rich, you know, <laughs> ever. Um, people have made money by having their brand become known, like Rusty, when he became a clothing company, that's when he made millions of dollars, you know. Um, I don't, so, I guess what I'm, my focus is more on design and how something works, and I know by looking at the design elements and, and different, uh, using different materials and things like that, that the boards work better and better and better. Um, but towards the end of the Clark Foam era, which is like that board I showed you, I was getting kind of like, really jaded in my boards. I've been, been getting the same kind of board forever and ever and ever, and what was it, and, and uh, yeah. So I hope that answered your question somehow. I'm not sure if I did. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hope the photographer can ask a question. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, towards the end, you were saying something about uh, how you were making boards that were geared more towards replicating like the uh, skating experience in the uh, mm -hmm. surfing uh, yeah. Well, from what I know, um, see, I started skateboarding before I started surfing, and um, I started riding a skateboard in like 1966 or 67, and then uh, I got really, really into it when I was about 14 or so, uh, but that was when I'd peaked on it, and, um, and uh, at that time, there was no, it was just really mostly that on that level, it was kids that surfed that were riding s skateboards and trying to do, and it was very, there was no scene attached to it. It had no, nothing attached to it at all. And then it kind of blew up after a while by the late 70s. And then in 1980, I, uh, I broke my arm twice, um, skating in pools, you know. And uh, 1980, I kind of stopped skating, but I watched the whole thing go, you know, go. part of what Craig Stesick did when he wrote the Dogtown Chronicles and everything, Stesick was a surfer, first and foremost, and he was there at the front, but he was bitter about what was going on in surfing with the commercial, rise of commercialization and all that stuff, and he sort of intentionally, he contextualized things in such a genius way that he, and he took all the photos, him and Glenn Friedman, and put it out there to the world and just birthed skateboarding in this completely different way and gave it a ton of, of freedom. Um, when Dogtown and Z-Boys came out in 2000, 2001, uh, my friend got an advanced copy of that. And uh, when I saw it, um, so they kind of intentionally distanced themselves from surfing. And those guys were all surfers. They always were and they still are. Um, when I got the advanced copy of it, I go, this is going to do gene brilliant things for surfing. And, and I really believe that. And I don't think a lot of people maybe saw it that way, but it goes, because what they did was they gave credit to the, the roots of skateboarding as coming from surfing. You know? So then now the two things are closer than ever. But the irony and the messed up thing is we've come to a board that performance-wise will allow you to almost you know, be as free as, as, as if you were a really good skater in a pool, and that's these type of boards. Some of the young pros now, Kalani David, John John Florence, 
all those guys, they're, they're um, really, really good skateboarders. And more and more young surfers are now. It's not separated anymore. But they're riding, they're not riding this. They're riding this, which is the one thing that I can't get yet. So what I'm waiting to happen is for one of those guys, and part of that leads to your question, because these guys are very much under the control of their shapers. They're not allowed to ride that stuff, you know? It's the same, or if they did, people would, you know, there's a lot of political control over what the best surfers in the world ride, these young athletes. And they're very much like I was when I was 18 years old. I rode the single fin, I rode what was in the magazines, and I, rode, I was exactly like that. But I feel like some of the shapers and the big, big brands um, sort of, they have a responsibility to progress it. And eventually, because this is sort of the hydrodynamic truth, and Simmons is the hydrodynamic truth of function, and so is this, that eventually it's going to come back in and it won't be able to stop it. Because a kid that skates really, really well is going to get on one of these type of designs, and it'll, that's my feeling. I, I don't see how it could not happen. And it, w it would change everything because they'll be able to do things almost like they're doing in a skate park, but in the water. They're doing it now, but they're doing it on, on boards that aren't, that don't, the design isn't, uh, the design is sort of archaic, even though they're the most advanced surfboards in the world. It goes back to this photo. This is here right now, but everybody's on this. And that's kind of the way I feel about it. I'm a little biased, but <laughs> anyway. Well, let's thank Richard. Okay.